How does a knee bike towing a bicycle camper compare with a motorhome with regards to energy and greenhouse gases? Stick around and that's what I'll be talking about. Last summer, I went on a 17-day electric bicycle tour with my bicycle camper. I rode a total of 767 kilometers. In this video, we'll be looking at how much energy it took to ride the distance with my camper and how that compares with different sizes of motorhomes or recreational vehicles. We'll also look at the difference in greenhouse gas emissions. There are many ways to express a quantity of energy. Scientists use joules, furnace manufacturers use BTUs, electric lights are measured in watts, the food we eat in calories, and the cars we drive in gasoline. To compare my electric bike to a motorized recreational vehicle, I had to make a choice of either kilowatt hours or gasoline. But since gasoline is more intuitive to us, we know what a liter or a gallon of gasoline looks like. I decided to convert the kilowatt hours of energy that the bicycle used into the amount of gasoline that contains the equivalent amount of energy. If you'd rather not bother with all the math, skip to 9 minutes 35 seconds. If I had thought of calculating my energy consumption before the trip, I would have brought along a watt meter and measured my power consumption every time I charged the battery. But since I didn't have that instrument, I resorted to two indirect methods, method 1 and method 2, to arrive at a pretty close approximation. The first thing I had to do was to determine how many watt hours the charger took from the Hydro-Quebec power grid. The charge indicator on the Pedigo City commuter displays the remaining charge by showing a row of six bars at the top left of the data display. As the kilometers build up, the bars drop off one by one, indicating how much battery power was used. For example, when three of the six bars have disappeared, approximately 50% of the battery power has been used. I kept a record of each time I charged one of my two batteries for a total of 18 partial or full charges. This table shows the number of bars that were used up before each of the 18 charging sessions. If we look at August 13, we see that all six bars of battery 1 were used, whereas on August 18 only one bar was used. Battery 2 had done the bulk of the work that day, with five bars gone. All told, for the entire trip, I used a total of 75 bars worth of battery power out of a potential of 108, which I would have used if I had emptied the batteries completely before each charging. This works out to an average of 69.4%, the average discharge state. Let's look at the first line of this chart. When a battery is completely empty, it takes 4 hours to recharge it. During the trip, there were 18 charging sessions. When we multiply 4 hours by 18 charging sessions, we get the potential of 72 hours. If the batteries had been completely emptied each time, the charger would have worked 72 hours. But most of the time, the batteries had been only partially emptied. So, to estimate the number of hours adjusted for full charges, we multiply the potential hours, 72, by the average discharge state, 69.4%, which gives us 50 hours of charging power. You might have to pause the video to let that sink in. It took me some time to figure it out. But what I'm leading to will become clearer in what follows. All this leads to method 1, which is based on the information provided by the charger's nameplate, the output of 3 amps and 58.8 volts. Multiplying amps times volts, we get 176.4 watt hours per hour of charging. We add 16% to compensate for the power losses from the power station and the battery charger, giving us 204.6 watt hours from the grid. This is for one hour, so we multiply by 50 for the 50 hours of full charge equivalent, 
and this gives 10,231 watt hours, which is 10.2 kilowatt hours, the red figure at the bottom of this table. Now we'll use a different calculation method. Method 2 is much simpler. It is based on the capacity of each of my two batteries. Battery 1 is 6 years old and has about 610 watt hours of energy left in it when full. If you want to see how I determined this, watch my video, The Best Way to Test an E-Bike Battery, linked in the description. Battery 2 was new this summer and it is assumed to have its full potential, 720 watt hours. The average of the two batteries is 665 watt hours, as you can see in line 3. I've added 16% to account for the transmission and charging losses in line 4, which gives 771 watt hours in line 5. In line 6, we adjust downward because of the average discharge state of 69.4%, and we get an average of 535 watt hours in line 6. This is multiplied by 18 charging sessions to give a final estimate of 9.6 kilowatt hours for the whole trip. The two methods come pretty close to the same answer, so I'll work with the average of both methods, 9.9 .9 kilowatt hours, which is the total amount of energy that I took from the Hydro-Quebec electrical grid to charge my batteries over the entire trip. So now we'll convert kilowatt hours into gasoline energy equivalent that I'll refer to as GEE. According to the US Department of Energy, there's the equivalent of 33.41 kilowatt hours of energy in one gallon of gasoline. One US gallon is equivalent to 3.8 liters, so that makes 8.79 kilowatt hours in one liter. We want to calculate how much GEE I used for the whole trip. In methods 1 and 2, we calculated that I used 9.9 .9 kilowatt hours from the grid all told. When we divide 9.9 .9 by the number of kilowatt hours per liter, which is 8.79, it reveals that I took 1.13 liters of gasoline energy equivalent for the whole trip. Now we're ready to calculate the e-bike's consumption in liters per 100 kilometers. I traveled 767 kilometers, which is 7.6700. We divided the GEE used for the whole trip by 7.67, and we discovered that my consumption was a mere 0 0.15 liters per 100 kilometers, or 1,597 miles per gallon. Now that we know how much GEE my bike has used during my trip, let's look at how much gasoline motorhomes or RVs consume. This table shows the ranges of consumption for the three major classes of motorhomes. The first column shows pictures of a sample of each class of camper. The second column shows the range of miles per gallon for each class. The third column shows liters per 100 kilometers, and the fourth column shows those numbers adjusted for EROI. What? What's EROI? EROI is short for Energy Return on Energy Invested. It refers to the energy it took to take oil from the energy company's boardroom to the consumer. It comprises all the energy required for exploration of new deposits, drilling, fracking, and pumping, transportation to the refinery, the refinery process itself, and transportation to the end user. Overall, the world average, we spend one barrel of oil to bring seven barrels to the market. This comes to 14.3%. Overall, the average fuel consumption for all three classes of motorized campers, including 14.3% EROI, is 20 liters per 100 kilometers, or 12 miles per gallon. Now we can compare my e-bike with the average motorhome. A simple division, 20 liters for the motorhome divided by 0.15 liters per 100 kilometers for my bike and camper, reveals that the motorhome would take 133 times more gasoline. But to be fair, what we need to consider is how many people are benefiting from that gasoline. We have to look at consumption on a per-person basis. If two people are sharing the motorhome, 
The energy is divided by two. If four people are sharing the same size motorhome, then they would be consuming only 33 times more gas than the bicycle and camper. Just for the fun of it, let's look at the largest of the large, a 45-foot motorhome that consumes 39 liters per 100 clicks, adjusted for Eroi, or 6 miles per gallon. The behemoth can hold six people, so each occupant's share of the consumption comes to only 43 times more per person than if they had traveled by electric bicycle. Some people are not that rich, so they might choose to travel with a car and tent trailer. If they have a very efficient vehicle, they might use only 10 liters per 100 kilometers, so a family of four would use only 17 times more per person than if each one had traveled independently with an e-bike and a barrio bicycle camper. There's another aspect of machines that has an effect on the environment in addition to the consumption of energy for its operation. Here we'll look at embodied energy, which is the total of all the energy it took to build the machine, whether an electric bicycle or a gasoline motorhome, from cradle to grave, so to say. Embodied energy can be calculated by doing a life cycle analysis, referred to as an LCA, which starts with mining and extracting the basic resources, such as metals, plastics, wood, water, chemicals, glass, and animal products such as leather, wool, or glue. And all the other steps required in separating the ore from the waste rock, transporting the resource to the processing plant, building the infrastructure and tools needed for assembly, manufacturing the item, packaging and storage, transportation to the distributor, to the retailer, and finally to the end user. And once the object has reached the end of its useful life, transportation to the recycling facility or the landfill, and finally, the recycling and landfilling process itself. This is a partial list of items that go into the construction of a house to illustrate the complexity of conducting an LCA. I wasn't able to find anything similar for motorhomes or for electric bikes, and even less for a barrier bicycle camper. If I could find detailed LCAs for these, I'd be able to compare the absolute quantities of energy for motorhomes and for my e-bike and camper. That would allow us to see how much more embodied energy is used by gas-consuming campers than my electricity-consuming one. But failing that, I figured there might be a way to get some sense of proportion. The main factor in a life cycle analysis is the quantity of each material, so here we're going to look at the difference in weight between the two modes of travel. We begin here with my e-bike and camper. This table shows the net vehicle weight, which comprises the bike, the bicycle accessories like saddlebags, mirror and the like, plus the camper itself without any cargo. Now we'll look at how much motorhomes in North America weigh by comparison. Class A motorhomes can be as big as a Greyhound bus and vary in weight from 16,000 to 30,000 pounds. Some of them will also tow a car or a motorboat used for local trips. So these would have to be added to the LCA and in this instance to the net weight. Class Bs vary from 5,000 to a high of 14,000 pounds and Class Cs are somewhat larger at 12 to 20,000 pounds. I calculated the overall average at 16,000 pounds, or 7,200 kilograms. Finally, here we can compare the weight of my bicycle and camper to motorhomes of various sizes. We can see that if we use mass as a basis for comparison of embodied energy, the smallest motorhome would have more than 30 times the embodied energy of my bike and camper, the average motorhome would be 100 times more, and the largest motorhome 200 times. It's widely believed that the carbon dioxide emitted by burning fossil fuels is a major contributor to global warming, and that the transportation sector should transition to clean electric energy. So now we will look at the global warming contribution of the different travel options that we've compared. For every liter of gasoline we burn, about 2.4 kilograms of carbon dioxide is added to the air. So traveling by electric bicycle with a bicycle camper, 
produces 17 times less carbon dioxide than a family of four with a tent trailer, 33 times less than an average motorhome with four people, 43 times less than a large motorhome with six people on board, and 67 times less than a couple traveling in an average size motorhome. Before you phone the Pope and ask him to canonize me as patron saint of bicycle camping, let me say that I don't travel this way to save the planet. I have less altruistic reasons for traveling by bicycle. Bicycle touring gives me a sense of freedom and adventure. It allows me to stay healthy of mind and body through the exercise I get by pedaling. It allows me to ride on some of the country's most beautiful roads. And to explore remote regions. I can stop on a dime if I want to have a better look at the scenery and to see details I would never appreciate if I were driving at 100 kilometers an hour. and to discover interesting trails and parks. And to take my time to enjoy all aspects of the road. And at the end of the day, to relax and to forget the hassles of everyday life. Before I finish, there are a few other important points I still need to raise. Remember this slide, the one that shows how many liters per 100 kilometers my e-bike and camper use during the trip? This economy of energy can only apply in jurisdictions where all or almost all the electricity comes from renewables, like the province of Quebec, where 95% of the power comes from hydro and a bit comes from wind and solar. But if you're traveling elsewhere in Canada or in the United States, or most places on Earth for that matter, chances are that the bulk of the electricity you plug into comes from burning coal, oil, and natural gas. And when that's the case, you'd have to double this estimate of your energy consumption. And at last, let's not forget the brave, strong cyclists who travel the world without electric assist, like this Russian man I met in Dawson City, Yukon. These cyclists use zero kilowatt hours of power to propel their bike and themselves, so when compared to motorized recreational vehicles, they use infinitely less energy per kilometer. I hope you found this analysis of my energy consumption useful or at least moderately entertaining. If you'd like to see more information about electric bicycles, bicycle campers, or bicycle touring, or if you'd like to buy one of my books on sailing, visit my website www.robertberio.com. And if you haven't already done so, subscribe to my channel by clicking on the red icon at the bottom right of your screen. And until next time, remember, never quit cycling.